Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Be seated. We're ready to proceed. Thank you all for being here on time. We did clear up a few minor legal matters, so we're ready to proceed with the continued cross-examination of Dr. Hassan. Officer, can you bring Dr. Hassan in, please? Thank you. Hi, Doctor. Welcome Hi. back. I'm going to ask you to remain standing because we had a break. We're going to re-swear you. You've been through this before. I can see that. Raise your right hand. Please listen. Do you swear in the presence of Almighty God that the testimony given to this court regarding this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Do. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. My name is Charles S. Hassan, H-A-S-S-O-N. Thank you. Fine, Doctor. Be seated. Mr. Shellhorn. You may continue your cross-examination. Thank you, Judge. Uh, good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. I think uh, where we left off yesterday was asking you some questions about the DSM. Uh, would you agree with me that there's no diagnosis in the DSM that's dispositive of any legal standard? I don't know about that. I doubt it. Because... Um, Psychiatric diagnoses and legal standard are two separate domains, so they may not uh, overlap. So meaning that if you find or diagnose someone with a specific diagnosis, that doesn't automatically mean they meet a legal standard? Well, first of all, I, I spelled out in my report in a lot of detail that when you're doing a, a report, you have to uh, determine the purported uh, forensic report, the purported intent of the action. Then what you have to do is to link the important, in, the purported intent with the diagnosis, those two. Then the third step is to take those two factors, the diagnosis, the purported intent, and then relate it to uh, either diminished capacity or a criminal uh, responsibility. So if you skip the steps, rather than getting, you know, do step one or step two, you have to do all three. So it's... Uh, to answer you directly, um, unless you spell it out, there's no set standard for a relationship between diagnosis and the legal standard. Meaning that just because you diagnose someone with delusional disorder, it doesn't automatically mean they meet a legal standard. I think on page 25 of your book, they point out the fact that these are the steps you have to do. You have to relate the diagnosis to some kind of functional deficit relate the functional deficit to the diagnosis. So I think you're saying that you agree with me. I don't know what you, I'm sorry to say it this way, but I'm not sure I fully understand what you're, you're, you're thinking. If you, if you die, and maybe just try answering my question. Diagnosis does not it, necessarily mean that it meets a particular standard. You have to demonstrate, you. according you. to DSM-5, the steps along the way, how you went from the Reported intent, the diagnosis, those two factors, and then related to the legal statute. So if someone is diagnosed with delusional disorder, it doesn't automatically mean that they meet a legal standard. Correct. You have to demonstrate the connection. That's stated clearly in the DSM-5. Now, you uh, were aware of Dr. Simmering's diagnoses before you rendered your opinion? Uh, yes. And you agreed with him that this defendant suffers from delusional disorder, persecutory type? Yes. You would agree that a person with delusions is capable of knowing right versus wrong? It depends on the situation, because um, paranoid delusions is a dimension. And I said the other day, it goes from normal population into very disturbed people. So it depends on what part of that normal curve you're talking about. You'd agree with me that a person with delusions could understand the nature and quality of their actions? You, you totally have to spell that out a lot more. It depends on the circumstance. There's not like a black or white type of delusional disorder. It, it, there's dimensionality here.
Doctor, how do you define a delusion? I, I mentioned the other day, it's a, uh, a belief based on incorrect thinking. Basically, there's an experience, then there's a belief based on incorrect thinking that comes to a conclusion that the person is not going to change no matter what kind of argument you give. So it's a thought that was produced uh, incorrectly. I gave examples when I in interviewed um, uh, Mr. Barrison of the uh, odd thinking that he had. And I thought it was an unusual you know, finding, but then I see that uh, um, some other people completely independent of me, but le on a much higher level, uh, have observed the same thing with regards to delusions, that it's a cognitive processing difficulty. Someone from um, University of Hawaii has written extensively on that, but I didn't know that before I observed those behaviors in him. So would you agree with me that a delusion is a false belief? It's a false belief, yes. What is Michael Barrison's specific delusion? Um, well, I touched on it yesterday and instead of from fireworks, <clears throat> he felt, he believes that if he was, he or Mary Haskins was in, incarcerated for some purported DSM, uh, excuse me, some purported DIFUS violation, that uh, the children were going to be hunted down and killed. He felt that very strongly. I don't believe that, but, you know. So his specific delusion was not believing... I'm sorry to interrupt. Thank you. So his specific delusion, in your opinion, is related to an incarceration arising from the DCP. It's so much broader than that. His delusion is this incredible fear. He's frightened that he will be, um, his life, Mary Haskins' life, the children's life will be snuffed out. That's why he sent the boy to North Carolina. He was frightened. He got very upset when he saw that uh, Robert uh, Goodman, Good, Goodwin, was uh, searching the internet for information regarding the children. He took that information and misconstrued it. Doctor, doctor, didn't I? Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I need to strike that answer. It's an improper answer. I struck it yesterday. I'm striking it again today, and hopefully we won't hear it again. You understand that, doctor? Correct. There's no evidence supporting that. Well, please disregard it. Don't consider it in your deliberations. Ask your next question. Doctor, if you don't understand my question, please just ask me to rephrase it, and I'll do the best that I can. I will. So and, even, my specific and even if you understand the question, just answer his question to the best of your ability. If Mr. Belinkus needs to follow up with you, he'll follow up. We call that redirect. Answer the prosecutor's question. So my question is not about the basis for your opinion. My question was, what is the specific delusion that you have diagnosed for Michael Barrison? He feels his life is threatened by Lauren Canarac and Robert Goodwin. When did that delusion, that specific delusion, start? Well, it started over a period of time. I would say well over a month. It gradually increased in intensity. But it wasn't just like two days. It was well over several weeks or many weeks. What specific piece of evidence do you rely on that the delusion began well over a month before the shooting. Well, no one can tell exactly when the delusion began, but based on um, his responding to information he was told, he read, and things that occurred, it made him more and more frightened. You didn't identify in your report 
a specific piece of evidence that shows that the delusion began well over a month before the shooting? I didn't, uh, no, I did not. And you'd agree with me that among the diagnostic criteria, criteria for delusional disorder is that the delusion existed for at least one month? Yes, I understand that. Now, you found that the defendant suffers from a subtype of delusional disorder, persecutory type? Yes. What are the symptoms or characteristics of persecutory type delusional disorder? Well, as it says, he feels as if he uh, feels as if there's a danger out there. He feels threatened personally. He feels that uh, all the things he's doing are being monitored, and he feels as if uh, that someone uh, can plan to kill him. And I'm not talking about Michael Barrison in particular. I'm talking in general. In what general, are the characteristics of the general, subtype of persecutory delusion? In general, disorder? the person believes that there's some threat in the outside environment to him. And if it was analyzed by the people, they might, people would not come up with that conclusion. So it's a false belief that the person is in danger that other people don't agree with. Correct. The, uh, the last part I didn't follow, that other people don't agree with? Wasn't the last part of your last answer that if other people didn't see it, well, or other people would try to talk the person out of it? Yes. So you'd agree with me that persecutory type delusional disorder could be characterized by a person having a false belief that there was a danger to themselves that other people didn't agree with? Yes. And that's broadly speaking about it. Now you indicated earlier that you received a version of events from Michael Barrison. Yes. And was that both in uh, combination with your interviews with him, as well as reviewing the written statements that he gave to Dr. Simring? Yes. You'd agree with me that by the time you met with him, he had received discovery in this case? Yes. And you'd agree with me that by the time he wrote those statements for Dr. Simring, he had received discovery in this Jackson. case? How does he know? Yeah, I'm not sure this witness would know that. Well, he could say that he doesn't know that. Do you know that, doctor? No. No, of course not. Did you ask him that? Did I ask him whether he, when he received the discovery? Did you ask him, or were you aware if he had access to discovery when he wrote the written statement? No, I don't know that. Now, you wrote in your report that among the defendant's fears were that he told police that Lauren Canterac had weapons. Yes. Did you listen to any of the 911 calls in this case? Yes. And you're aware that on July 31st, he would ask, he was asked if weapons were involved or mentioned, and his response was no. Correct. Objection, Judge. Let me see a time more. <clears throat> Dr. Hassan, I'm just going to re-ask the question again because I'm not sure at what point I stopped. But you're aware then that on the July 31st call to 911, the defendant was asked, were any weapons involved or mentioned? I'm aware he was asked. And you're aware that he responded no? Correct. <clears throat> you're aware that on August 1st, he called 911? Yes. And on that call, he was asked if weapons were involved or mentioned, and his response was no? Correct. You're aware that on August 3rd, he called 911? Yes. And he was asked whether weapons were involved or mentioned? Yes. 
And his response was, I have not heard a word of that. Okay. Are you aware on August 5th that he called 911? Yes. And he was asked if weapons were involved or mentioned? Correct. And his response was, not so far. Correct. You also, I think, testified yesterday, and it's in your report, that Michael Barrison told you that he believed Lauren Kanarek had declared war on him. Correct. On the July 31st call to 911, <clears throat> didn't he indicate, this is war, and I've had enough of these people, I need them gone? Yes, I read that. Did you ask him what he meant when he said that it was war with Lauren Kanarek? I took him at his face word about his view that um, uh, Lauren Canarac had um, issued some comments earlier that he had read using the word war. And then after listening to the 911 call from July 31st where he said, this is war, I've had enough of these people, I need them gone, you didn't ask him what he meant by that? No. And you agree with me that on July 31st, when he called 911 or around the time he called 911, he didn't shoot anyone then? No. Now I think, Doctor, you talked in your report uh, and indicated that the defendant was taken to St. Clair's Hospital. Well, I saw on one of the forms it said St. Clair's Hospital. Emergency, I put the squad or So that was a Saint, that was a mistake in your report. No, I was I did I say St. Clair's Hospital? It said St. Clair it was a staff member for Saint from St. Clair's. Well I can direct you to uh, page eleven of your report, which is S eighty eight. I believe you wrote on the August 7th entry, emergency medical staff at St. Clair's Hospital reported that on arrival. Correct. The way I interpreted was that these people said, since it said on the form, St. Clair's Hospital, I assume they were sent from St. Clair's Hospital. That's why I wrote that. Now you also, uh, you referred to that report, uh, that EMT report. Yes. I think you testified some yesterday about uh, when you were asked questions about various types of amnesia and psychogenic amnesia, dissociative amnesia, you were asked the question uh, and you responded uh, with a, an answer about traumatic brain. Do you remember that? Correct. Now you're aware that there's no diagnosis of traumatic brain injury in this case? Not from the experts. There was a rule out diagnosis of TBI, with altered uh, mental status. Who gave that rule One of the out? doctors. I think the doctor who wrote down the adjustment disorder had a rule out diagnosis of uh, TBI with uh, altered mental state. But you're aware that nobody actually diagnosed any traumatic brain injury? Correct. Doctor, you never asked Michael Barrison about when he first obtained Ruth Cox's gun, did you? I did. Is that in your report? I don't know if it is, but I, from my recollection, he told me that she came in very late at night, and um, uh, he asked if she had a weapon, and he thought that um, the cars could be subject to uh, either scrutiny or being uh, uh, open and that he thought that she should put the weapon in his safe. Would it surprise you to know that none of that is in your report? Okay. You didn't think that that was a salient detail to include in your report? Um, I don't think it mattered what time, when, or what time he put it in. So you don't think him obtaining the gun that he's accused of using to shoot two people several days later that when he obtained that, you don't think that that matters? I don't think it's, 
for at least for me. I don't feel it's pertinent to my conclusion in the case when he received the gun when he put it in the safe. I have no further questions, Judge. All right. <clears throat> Redirect. Doctor, yesterday the prosecutor was showing you numerous articles and, and different books with regards to uh, psychiatry. Do you recall those? Yes, I do. Um, is there an equal number of articles and books that say the exact opposite thing that he showed you? Without a doubt, 200 percent. As a matter of fact, after I left yesterday, I read the book that um, uh, Mr. Shulhan referenced. And so the record is clear. You had never been shown that book or given advance notice that he was going to show that to you, correct? Without a doubt. I didn't know about that book. I didn't know about that reference. Now, did you read that book? Last, last night I did. I got it through Kindle. And, and it explains the mystery. And uh, what, if anything, would you like to say with regards to that in reference to the specific things that he showed you? Well, in Chapter 3, there was, uh, that's the chapter he showed me. Judge, not to interrupt, but could we just so the record is clear? Uh, I showed Dr. Hassan a number of things yesterday, but just so the record is clear, he can indicate what he's reading from, mm -hmm. which book he's referring to. This is the book by um, um, John, uh, I want to say Bachelor, it's not. Um, I forgot his, I forgot his, uh, Butcher, Butcher. Yes, James Butcher, James Butcher. Uh, John Bachelor is a radio uh, personality, or was. Uh, the particular item that he that uh, Mr. Shalhoun showed me was a paragraph describing uh, paranoid uh, features if someone had a high score on scale six. And I noticed when I looked at it, there was no uh, numbers in there. It just when you mean no numbers, what do you no prefer? scores? There was no scores. I, I I was taken aback, and it was and so what, short. What's the significance of scores? Well, it's low, medium, and high. They're completely different. There was none of that in there. So I got the book via Kindle last night, and I read that section. Yeah, I understand why. Because the author of the book said, I suggest you uh, look up articles by other experts to get more in-depth information. This is what he wrote. Chapter 3 provides a brief... Can I just ask what page we're reading from, Judge? I have the book here so I can follow along. Well, I, I have it from location 897 in the book, so I can't tell you. It's somewhere in Chapter 3 in the area where you showed me that there were no T-scores. You had me look at that with you. Continue, Doctor. Chapter 3 provides a brief overview of each of the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory-2 parentheses MMPI hyphen two clinical content and supplementary scales in turn more in-depth information on each of these scales is available in any of the standard MMPI hyphen two reference books such as Butcher, Butcher and Williams, Friedman, uh, Bolinsky, Lewin, uh, Nichols, Graham and Green. So over here yes this is a typical reference book by David Nichols, who was quite nice to me one time when I called him up. Now, if you look in this book, here, it gives specific information on scale six, and I referenced it in my, uh, my report. If you're very high on scale six, paranoia, and you're low on schizophrenia, it suggests that the person has an encrusted delusional disorder targeted to one particular person. And um, uh, a high score on scale six is indicative or suggestive of a delusional disorder. I gave other references there, but that's what I found yesterday. Okay. Now, with regards to his questions concerning feigning, um, is it correct if I can simplify the term as someone telling the truth? Not telling, if you're feigning, you're not telling the truth. Right. 
That's what I mean, whether, whether or not someone is telling the truth, correct? Correct. Now, with regards to Michael's repeated statements to the first aid people, to the EMS personnel, Morristown Medical, Morristown Hospital, and the Morris County Correctional Facility, where he said he didn't remember. Did you take into account those specific medical reports and references <clears throat> with regards to your determination as to whether or not Michael Barrison was feigning? Well, feigning is determined by testing. It's not determined by just your, your subtle opinion. If I found no evidence of feigning either personality or cognitive or neuropsychological with them, with the exception of the Tom that's questionable results there anyway. So to answer you directly, I found no evidence of feigning. Uh, there was repeated uh, references that he couldn't remember um, the event. And, and in addition to your testing, do those references close in time to the incident um, confirm whether or not uh, that testing is accurate? I don't know about that. I mean, to me, um, uh, consistently he reported he couldn't remember. He was dazed. There were statements that uh, he had partial consciousness, and um, uh, that's consistent with the possibility of a mild TBI or some type of uh, extreme anxiety that obliterated that memory. Now, w with regards to his statement testified to uh, where he allegedly said, I'm sorry, in the hospital, were you aware that prior to that he was injected with 100 milligrams of fentanyl? Yes. And, and what, if anything, would that drug fentanyl uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know that he's qualified to say that. He's not a medical doctor. Are you familiar with the effects of, of fentanyl, doctor? Well, Same objection. Yeah. Right? If, if you're going to pursue this, I need to have a 104 hearing outside the presence of the jury. I'll move on, Judge. All right. Questions withdrawn. Yesterday, the prosecutor was asking you questions uh, as to whether or not someone's mistaken belief would affect uh, your delusional diagnosis. Did you review the safe sport complaint um, that Lauren Canterac made against Michael Barrison? Yes. Were there allegations of Judge, sexual I'm, I'm misconduct? Uh, hold on, there's an objection, Mr. Belinkus. I, I didn't finish the question. I, I know, and there's an objection. It doesn't mean you keep talking when there's an objection. Say the same thing to witnesses. Sustained. Prosecutor asked you questions about the 911 calls. Yes. With regards to questions that were repeatedly asked with regards to those specific instances, did the questions concerning weapons have to do with those? Judge, this is going to call for speculation. How, how does this witness possibly know that? If he heard the 911 calls, he, he would have. And you're, you're asking him to interpret? The questions and what was asked by the police officer and what, what the police officer was asking? You can't answer that question. No further questions, You have any follow up? No, thank you. All right, you may step down, Doctor. Thank you.
Any further witnesses, Mr. Belinkus? No, Judge, other than uh, admitting uh, numerous photographs, which I don't believe the court right. has any objections to. All right. We don't have to do that now. We can do it at a, at a break or at, at the close of business. We'll get on with the witnesses. So no, no further witnesses other than the admission of some photographs and defense, defense rest. Mr. Shellhorn, does the state have any rebuttal witnesses? Yes, Judge. All right, call your first rebuttal witness. Judge, this did it. Can I have uh, Dr. Hassan back in the courtroom? Yes, you can listen. <clears throat> Judge, the state will call Dr. Lou Schlesinger. All right, Dr. Schlesinger. Doctor, good afternoon. All right, left hand on a, you know the routine. Left hand on a bottle, raise your right hand. Please listen to my court clerk. Do you so in the presence of Almighty God that the testimony goes to this court regarding this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Uh, Lewis, L O U I S, Schlesinger, S C H L E S I N G E R. Thank you. All right, you may have a seat, doctor. Please keep your voice up nice and loud. If you don't understand a question, please indicate that. I'll have counsel rephrase. Go ahead, prosecutor. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, doctor. Good morning, Can you please introduce yourself to the jury and tell them what you do for a living? Um, well, Louis Lessinger, I'm a forensic psychologist. What is forensic psychology? It's simply the application of behavioral science to the law. It's as simple as that. Are you licensed as a psychologist? Yes. Can you tell the jury about that? I'm, I'm a licensed psychologist. Yeah. How long have you been licensed? Since 1976. Uh, are you board certified? Yes. Can you tell the jury about that? I'm board certified as a forensic psychologist from the American Board of Professional Psychology. I've been board certified for well over 30 years. So there is board certification in the field of psychology? Definitely. Can you tell the jury a little bit about your educational background? Sure, I received my uh, doctorate, my PhD in 1975 from the New School for Social Research in New York City. I was a trainee at Greystone Psychiatric Hospital from 71 to 73. I did my internship with the New Jersey Clinical Internship Program in Psychology from 73 to 74 where I trained at the New Jersey uh, State Diagnostic Center. That was the state's forensic center at that time. I rotated, uh, did another rotation at Trenton State Prison, and then Trenton Psychiatric Hospital, the Varun Building Readjustment Unit. Today it's Ancline Forensic Center, but it used to be called uh, the Varun Building. I did some uh, postgraduate training at the New York Center for Psychoanalytic Training from 76 to 78, where I took courses in uh, psychoanalytic theory and therapy. And I had uh, postdoctoral individual super supervision from 75 to 77, which is, which is required. I'm licensed, board certified. I am a tenured full professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York, which is part of the City University of New York. And um, I've been there since uh, 1997. Can you, can you tell us a little more about that, about your teaching experience there, Doctor? Uh, John Jay College is the, is the criminal justice um, school for the City University of New York. City University is a mass um, university. Baruch College is the business school. City College is the, <coughs> the arts. And John Jay is really the criminal justice school. Um, I teach uh, undergraduates, master's students, and doctoral students um, as well. I, I, um, Teach forensic psychology. I'm, a, I'm a, a, yeah, a full professor of forensic psychology. And I was just going to ask you that. What type of courses do you teach? Well, I teach um, psychopathology, um, forensic psychology, uh, crime scene analysis, and um, homicide. I teach a specific course in homicide as well. Can you tell the jury a little bit about some of the professional activities that you're involved in? Well, uh, professional activities... Um, in, in a, well, I've had a lot of clinical experience, but other, other than my clinical experience, I was um, 
elected president of the New Jersey Psychological Association in 1989. Prior to that, I was a vice president on the executive board. I was also um, a member and later chair of the State Ethics Committee from, 19, uh, from 1982 to 1988. I was also a member of the Forensic Psychology Committee from 1980 to the present. I was president of the New Jersey Psychology Political Action Committee from 91 to 93. I was a member of the Board of Trustees of the New Jersey Psychological Foundation from 96 to 98. I was president of the Society of Psychologists in Private Practice from 2001 to 2002. I've been on the executive board of the uh, Essex Union County Association of Psychologists from 2007 to 2008. I was elected member of the Council of Representatives of the American Psychological Association. Um, I did that from 91 to 94. The American Psychological Association, the Council of Representatives of the American Psychological Association is really like their executive committee. And, um, and so I did that for several years. I was also um, treasurer of a division of group psychotherapy and editor of that group psychotherapy bulletin. I was an advisory board member from 83 to 88 of the uh, American College of Forensic Psychology. I was uh, a member of the Board of Trustees of the New Jersey Academy of Psychology. From 1980 to 1987, I was a member and later chair of the Special Classification Review Board at the Adult Diagnostic and Treatment Center at Avenel. I was appointed by the governor of New Jersey and the Commissioner of Corrections. That's the board that evaluates inmates at the um, ADTC, Sex Offender Unit, and makes recommendations to the parole board um, for, for, uh, for their release. I have been an associate editor of the International Journal of Offender Therapy and Comparative Criminology from 2005, and on the editorial board of the Journal of Threat Assessment from, 2000, from 1999 to 2003. Doctor, can I just interrupt you on that? When sure. you say that you're the editor of something like that, what does that mean? I, I was associate editor, not the editor. I was associate editor. What's the difference? Well, the editor is in charge of the journal. The editor has an editorial board, and they review papers that are presented for publication. That's basically what you do. They're not, a journal is not limited to, to, to uh, the editorial board. Very often they'll send it out to external reviewers as well. Um, since 2000, I've been a co-principal investigator on a major research project with the FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit down in Quantico, um, where we studied, we have thousands of extraordinary crimes, files we got from the FBI, and we have a major research project where we study extraordinary crime, sexual murder, serial murder, serial rape, suicide <coughs> by cop, bias <coughs> homicide, um, domestic homicide, and, and other forms of um, serious crime, which resulted in some major publications as well. In 2004, myself and four of my colleagues at John Jay conducted the research on uh, sexual abuse in a Catholic church by uh, priests and deacons from um, 1950 to, to 2002. Um, the uh, US it was, it was under the auspices of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the uh, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops reached out to John Jay to do this um, for, for a couple of reasons. But uh, one is, the, um, because we had the FBI project, it, it, it was going so well. L let me say one thing. The FBI is a very paranoid organization. They do not like to share their information with others. So, but they did with us in terms of all their files. We have a room almost the size of this just filled with files. There was no problem at all in terms of confidentiality or anything like that. So um, the head of the FBI at that time, the, 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 the deputy head, uh, left and was hired by the uh, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops to conduct this study. And because of uh, the very good experience that we had with the FBI, that's how John Jay was selected to do it. So we did that and we presented our results um, to, to the bishops. Um, I have also been a member of the Senate Task Force on Internet uh, Information for Registered Sex Offenders. Um, uh, I, was, well, I was appointed by the acting governor and the, Sen and the Senate president. Um, what happened was um, New Jersey needed to uh, redo Megan's Law. That's the community notification 
um, of, of registered sex offenders. And in, but before they did that, they put together a task force. Um, I was on it representing um, mental health. Um, there was someone from the prosecutor's office, the defense bar, uh, Senator um, Anverso was on it. It was Megan, Megan Kanka's senator, uh, Joe Vitale, who was uh, um, a senator as well as on it. There was someone, uh, someone else, uh, someone from Rutgers was on it as well, I think. And we um, basically rewrote the law and we held public hearings and so on. Um, and there was a number of reasons why that had to be done, but it's not relevant to anything uh, else. I've been uh, um, on the Research Advisory Board of the FBI, then specifically the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime at the Behavioral Analysis Unit from 2010 to 2012. And I've been a periodic instructor at the FBI since 2008, although I haven't been there in a while. I mean, you know, we're all shut down and so on. And I've wor had a lot of different jobs um, over the years. Clinical I was just going to ask you if you could tell the jury about some of your clinical experience. Clinical experience, right. So um, in addition to being a, 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 a tenured professor, I've also had a private practice of clinical and forensic psychology since 1976. I was um, a consultant at Fair Oaks Hospital, or now it's called Summit Hospital, from 76 to 2000, uh, where I worked with adults and adolescents, and, and almost exclusively psychological evaluations, very limited therapy, only early on. I've been a consultant at Little Hill Alina Lodge in Blairstown, New Jersey, from 1998 to the present. That's a substance abuse unit, a long-term treatment program for substance abuse. I was also on the staff of the uh, VA Medical Center in East Orange from 1976 to 1999. And there I worked on their alcohol and substance abuse program. I worked on their uh, compensation and pension program. That's where veterans get evaluated for PTSD and that type of thing. But I also founded a violence clinic in the VA, which the, clinic, the purpose of the clinic was to evaluate people with respect to a problem with violence, uh, and then we treated them. And it was the first uh, violence clinic in the entire VA system, and it became um, brought into the PTSD program when the PTSD program st uh, started, and uh, so on. And I coordinated that from 77 to 92. Prior to that, I was on the staff of JFK Medical Center in Edison. I worked um, in their mental health center, and I also worked at their rehab unit as well. And I was a consultant to the Edison Police Department, the Juvenile Aid Bureau, from 75 uh, to 70, uh, 75 to 76. <clears throat> Doctor, have you ever received any awards uh, in recognition of things you've done? Uh, yes. Can you tell the jury about some of those awards? Yes. Um, in 1990, I was, um, awarded, I was awarded Psychologist of the Year by the New Jersey Psychological Association. In 1993, I received the Carl F. Heiser Presidential Award from the American Psychological Association. In 2003, I received the Distinguished Service Award from the Society of, Psych from the Society of Psychologists in Private Practice. From 2005 to, present, uh, to the present, I've been a, a distinguished practitioner in the National Academies of Practice. The National Academies of Practice is based up of nine medical specialists, including psychologists, and each specialty is limited to 100 people in that specialty. And the purpose is to advise the United States Congress on matters of health care. And so uh, I, I've been on that. And in 2014, I received the Distinguished Researcher Award from the New Jersey Psychological Association. I was just going to ask you about some of your uh, professional organizations that you're a member of. Yeah. Uh, I'm a fellow of the American Psychological Association. A fellow is a little bit different than being a member. Um, I was a member for many years, but when the American Psychological Association determines that your work, your contribution, had national impact, they can elect you to be a fellow. It can't be local or state. They have to determine that it was national impact. Uh, so I'm a fellow of the APA. I've been a fellow of um, the New Jersey Psychological Association. I said I was president of that um, a while back. I'm also uh, a member of the American Academy of Forensic Psychology. I'm actually a fellow of, of the American Academy of Forensic Psychology. It's not on my CV, but I, I am. Um, a member of the Essex Union County of Association of Psychologists. 
the Society for Personality Assessment, and also a member of the uh, International Rorschach Exchange. And um, what's that? It's just a, a scientific group that sends out uh, um, once or twice a year uh, a book called Rorschachana, and it's just research and and people write things about their their um, research on the Rorschach. Have you ever published anything related to the field of psychology? Yes. Can you uh, tell the jury, have you ever published any books? I've had 12 books published. Um, in 1978, I published Violence, Perspectives on Murder and Aggression. In 1980, I published Handbook on Stress and Anxiety. In uh, 1981, um, Psychopathology of Homicide. In uh, 1983, uh, the title of the book was Sexual Dynamics of Antisocial Behavior, and there was a second edition in 1997. In 1989, I published Sex Murder and Sex Aggression. In uh, 1996, I published um, Explorations in Criminal Psychopathology, Clinical Syndromes with Forensic Implications, and there was a second edition in 2007. The, the reason I published that was clinical syndromes with forensic implications because the DSM often doesn't do well with a lot of disorders that are forensically related because the DSM really wasn't set up to be a forensic manual. It's set up for hospital practice, mental health centers, offices, and so on. So, um, so that book supplemented it. In, in, in a sense. So, so what you mean, is there is there nuance to applying diagnoses from the DSM in a forensic setting? Well, not nuance. There's disorders that are, um, that Jay, you are see. We, are we still doing qualifications at this point? Uh, I think we are. Are we, Mr. Shaw? We are. All right, save that question for later. Though. I will, Judge. All right. So moving on, you were telling us about some of your books. Doctor. Yeah, and then 2000, I published Serial Offenders, Current Thought, Recent Findings. Um, in 2004, Sexual Murder, Catathymic, and Compulsive Homicides, a specific type of sexual murder. And uh, the second edition came out last year. In 2017, I uh, published a book titled Psychiatric Aspects of Criminal Behavior. It's the Collected Papers of Eugene Revich. This is an edited book. Eugene Revich was a psychiatrist and a, a teacher of mine. And um, he actually became a mentor of mine, and we became colleagues and friends. And um, his papers, many of which were published in the 1950s and 60s and, and 70s, are as relevant today as they were then. And they meant so much to me when I trained, I almost memorized them. And I didn't want them to get lost in the archives somewhere, so I put it together into an edited book where the first part is on uh, sexual aggression, the second part on criminal behavior, and the third part of the book is on epilepsy and epileptoid violence. Dr. Revich is also a neurologist, and there's a number of articles in there on what's called paroxysmal manifestations of non-epileptic origin. Sounds fancy, but all it means is an explosion that's really not a result of epilepsy. Sometimes that's hard to differentiate. So. Um, so that's that book. It was a book of honor, really, to somebody, and got really, really good reviews, um, I, I, which I was happy about. But I had nothing to do with the content. I just put it together. Doctor, have you ever written any uh, chapters in any books? Yes, I've written, I think, about 25 uh, chapters in, um, in different people's books. I, I've been invited to write chapters, and... Um, about so I think it's around 25 chapters in, in different books. Some are my own books. Some were uh, many were other people's books as well. Have you ever published articles in any journals? <clears throat> yes, I've published um, about uh, I believe it's 43 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals. Um, what's a what's a peer-reviewed scientific journal? A, a peer-reviewed scientific journal is when you publish an article, research, or it doesn't have to necessarily be research. It could be a, um, a theoretical article or, or a literature review. You send it into a journal, and then you get what's called a blind review. Your identity is removed. Uh, all identifiers are removed. And they send it out to three, four, or five experts in the field to review it, your peers. And then they give feedback, and then you do what you have to do. Um, and so that's what, that's what the peer review process is. It's a, um, 
it, it's a fairly long process, and um, in many top journals, there's about a 90% rejection rate. So a, a lot of people don't realize that. But I've published in all of the top uh, journals, including uh, the American Academy, uh, the Journal of the American Academy of Forensic Psychiatry, uh, Behavioral Science in the Law, uh, the Journal of Forensic Sciences, um, Journal of Family Violence, uh, International Journal of Offender Therapy and Comparative Criminology, um, and, other, and, other, and other top journals. And a lot of it is on uh, various, it's almost all on criminal behavior and extraordinary criminal behavior, sexual murder, serial sexual murder, necrophilia, crime scene staging, undoing, which is symbolic reversal at a crime, a homicide crime scene, foreign object insertions, uh, and so on. We recently published, and a lot of this was in, in collaboration with the FBI, because we have their um, extraordinary cases from all over the country. Um, and recently, I, we published an article on confessions. Um, you know, you hear a lot about false confession. There's a lot of research on false confession, but our study was not on false confession, it was on confessions. How do people confess? Because people confess in different ways depending upon uh, their crime. Doctor, have you ever testified uh, at a trial? Yes. What, uh, can you estimate approximately how many times you've testified at a trial? Uh, I, I never kept a record of how many times I've done this, uh, and I'm not good at estimating how many times I've done things, but I've been doing this now 46 years, 100, 200, perhaps 300 times. I, I just don't know. And were you qualified as an expert? Yes. Uh, what are some of the topics that you've testified regarding? I mean, I've testified in state of mind cases, insanity, diminished capacity, passion provocation, duress, voluntary intoxication, competency to proceed, competency to waive Miranda rights, sentencing issues. Um, Have you ever uh, been hired? Obviously, you're here testifying as my witness at, on behalf of the prosecutor today. Have you ever been hired by the defense? I have. In the, in the first third of my career, I've testified just about exclusively for the defense. I was hired mostly by the defense. In the last third of my career, I've been retained mostly by the prosecutor. And in the middle, it kind of went in different ways. Have you ever given an opinion that was different from the party or the side that hired you? Yes. Can you estimate in the last call it 10 years approximately how many times that's happened? Well, I can tell you the, the exact time in the past 10 or a little bit longer, 10, maybe almost 15 years because I have a record of it. And the, re the reason I have a record of it is someone asked me just that question maybe 10, 12 years ago. And, and they asked me, essentially, did you ever get hired by the prosecutor, for example, and gave an opinion uh, consistent with the defense expert? And I said yes. Now, when you're in court, and someone asks you if you ever did something, and you say yes, the next question is, how many times did you do it? And I didn't know how many times I did it. So I kept the record then uh, of the times of the various um, offices that I was retained by, uh, as well as defense, as well as defense. And so what is the number in the approximately last 10 to 15 years that you've uh, given an opinion uh, okay. different from the party that hired you? Okay, now you want a number, so I'm going to have to count this. So. You, just give me a second. Okay. Okay, just give me a second. <clears throat> okay, I, I, I came up with thirty. <laughs> 30, we're at, yeah, 30. Since you started keeping track. Yeah. Doctor, do you have any experience with psychological testing? Um, yes, I have, um, I have extensive experience with psychological testing. Psychological testing is very simple. It, it, it's, a beta, it's simply a way to measure mental process. It's, 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 it's really nothing more difficult and more complicated than that. And it's generally pretty straightforward psychological testing, but I will say if you don't know what you're doing, you can really mess this up real quickly. Do you I, any, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say I taught psychological testing for over 20 years. When I was on the faculty of um, the New Jersey Medical School, I was on a faculty over there. I don't know if I even mentioned that, but I was on a faculty over there 
at um, UMD and J for um, from ninety from seventy seven to uh, ninety nine, I think, or two thousand. For twenty three years, I taught psychological testing to third year medical students who rotated through uh, psychiatry service. I also conducted a year long psychodiagnostic seminar for our doctoral interns who were training over at the VA and um, did that for over 20 years um, as well. Um, in addition, I've published two papers on the Rorschach um, in journals. I um, also developed my own projective test um, entitled the, uh, the Criminal Fantasy Test. And it was really based on, as a projective test, and based on the format of the thematic apperception test, which is simply a test. You show a person a somewhat ambiguous picture, and their job is to create a story based on the picture. And you get kind of their inner fantasies, uh, their inner thoughts, and so on. Because sometimes an individual, patient or otherwise, if you ask them a question, they won't tell you directly. But if you give them a test and ask them to create a story, very often it's revealed in that. So I, I was always impressed with the content that I got from the TAT. So I worked with an artist, a colleague of mine worked with an artist, and we developed uh, a, a, a fant criminal fantasy test of 12 different ambiguous sorts of crimes, and the object was to create a story about it. It was published in 1981 in the Journal of Clinical Psychology. At that time, a number of test publishers wanted me to develop this into a, 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 marketed, a marketable test where you could you know, sell it and, and that sort of thing, and, and I did not do it. I should have done it. It's one of my greatest professional regrets because I think of all of the people that I saw over the past 40 years, um, but I, I, I didn't do it. But anyway, um, I did that. Also, um, I discussed psychological testing in... Uh, several of my books, or, or many of my books, and, and how to do it, and what to do, what not to do, and how to go about it, and so on. Would you ever render a diagnosis based on a psychological test? No. You never render a diagnosis based on a psychological test. Psychological testing can support a diagnosis. A diagnosis is made clinically, and it's made based on the clinical criteria, symptoms and behaviors, delineated in the DSM-5. Now, the DSM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's been around since 1952. It goes through different editions. That's how you make a diagnosis, based on symptoms and behavior. Now, what's the value of testing? Well, testing can support a diagnosis or it can go in a different direction and not support a diagnosis. But you never make a diagnosis based on psychological testing. As a matter of fact, if you look at some of the tests that have computer printouts, I don't use those, but a, a lot of people do, it says very clearly, these are hypotheses, these are suggestions, these are for your consideration. But no, the answer to your question directly, you never make a diagnosis based on psychological testing. Judge, at this point I'd like to offer Dr. Schlesinger as an expert in the field of forensic psychology. <clears throat> Mr. Belinkus, do you have any questions as to the qualifications of the doctor or any opposition? No, Judge. All right. All right, based on the background of Dr. Schlesinger, uh, as outlined in his testimony, I do find, pursuant to Rule 702 of the New Jersey Rules of Evidence, that he qualifies as an expert, and he may, uh, in forensic psychology, and may testify in the form of opinion. I make this determination based on his education, his knowledge, skill, experience, and training, uh, and extensive work history. All right, very good. He'll qualify as an expert. Go ahead, Mr. Shellhorn. Doctor, is there any difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist in a forensic setting? Uh, yes, yes, there is, there is a difference. Um, there's a difference in training. A psychiatrist after college goes to medical school and studies medicine. And then he or she does a four-year residency in psychiatry, where they study you know, diagnosis, DSM, and usually treatment with medication. Not all the time, but usually treatment with medication and, and some uh, psychotherapy. Um, a psychologist after uh, college goes to graduate school for four, five, six years, depending upon uh, their uh, program and their, how they get through it and gets training in behavioral science and psychopathology, diagnosis, evaluation, uh, and, and uh, testing, and uh, treatment, and so on. 
And then a psychologist does um, a clinical internship, a pre-doctoral internship, and then he does a, at least a year of postdoctoral supervision or more. Psychologists and psychiatrists train together. I mean, I've been trained by psychiatrists. Dr. Revich was a mentor of mine, and he was my, uh, he's a psychiatrist, he was my main teacher. And, um, uh, and, and um, so I've been trained by psychiatrists, but I, I taught at the medical school for years. Um, I taught undergraduates, that's medical students, they're called undergraduates uh, in medicine um, uh, for years. Um, I taught um, interviewing with, uh, with them, uh, testing, I said, with the third year residents, and I, uh, with, with third year medical students, and with uh, psychiatry residents, I uh, supervised them uh, with um, their, their experience at the substance abuse unit, and specifically with group therapy and evaluation with respect to substance abuse. In addition, psychologists and psychiatrists practice together all the time. I practiced for 25 years with a psychiatrist in Summit, Sergio Estrada. Um, you know, we each had our patients, he did medication, I did psychotherapy, I did evaluations for him. Um, it's, a, it's a great collaboration, so, uh, and, you know, I, I, I've worked with him and, and throughout, and, and very, very collegially, and that's the difference, basically. Doctor, in this case, were you asked to see and examine Michael Barrison? Uh, yes. Do you see Mr. Barrison in court? Um, I think it's, this, I think that's Michael sitting next to his attorney, although I will say he looks very different than when I saw him. Can you describe uh, what's different about him? Well, when I saw him, he was well-groomed and looked appropriate, and, and now he looks long, disheveled hair. I, I, that's not how he looked when I saw him. Do you recall approximately when you saw him? Um, I saw him uh, exactly on January 29th, uh, March 12th, and April 29th, 2021, last year. And, Doctor, are you referring to a copy of your report? Yes. Judge, I'm just going to indicate for the record that that was marked as S-404. For purposes of the record. All right, very good. Doctor, when you were first asked uh, to see and examine Michael Barrison, uh, what did you do first? Well, first I did psychological, but well, before I saw him, I familiarized myself with the discovery, and, and that's, that's what you have to do. A, for, a forensic assessment has three parts. The facts of the case, that you get from the discovery. The discovery is the police reports and witness statements and all the rest. The second part of a forensic assessment is the psychopathology. Is there a disorder? What's the disorder? And so on. And the third part is that the jury will take the facts and the disorder, psychopathology, and relate it to a legal standard, whatever that is. Now, in this case, uh, you indicated that you did review discovery and that that's an important part of the process. Uh, do you recall what discovery you reviewed? I reviewed the complete state's case, everything. There was thousands and thousands of pages of text messages and everything. And, and there were um, uh, um, videos, you know, recorded statements. And so on. I was just going to ask you, did, did you watch or listen to any of the recorded witness statements? Yes, some were video statements, some were just uh, audio, but I, I, I listened to everyone, yes. Why would you listen to the statements or watch the statements as opposed to relying on a summary or a, a report? Well, you could read the summary in the report, too. A lot of the statements are summarized in the police report, but that's not the way to do it. You want to see, that, that's some person saying what they think found to be significant and you you are obligated to look at it yourself and make your own determination and get and get a you know get a, a look at what the person said in whole not just a summary of what the person said did you also review any uh, reports that were authored by uh, any psychiatrist hired by the defendant yes and that was that dr. Simmering dr. Simmering do you know Dr. Simmering? I know Dr. Simmering very well. I've known Dr. Simmering for over 30 years. I have the highest regard for Dr. Simmering. He's a friend of mine. Dr. Simmering is competent, he's experienced, he's intelligent, he's funny, and he's, and he's an extremely nice guy, which I think I said to you at least 50 times. And I've worked with Dr. Simmering on cases. I've worked opposite Dr. Simmering on cases. I referred cases to Dr. Simmering. He's referred cases to me. I have the highest regard for Dr. Simmering. But I disagree with him in this case, but that has nothing to do with my high regard for Dr. Simmering. Have you agreed with him in certain cases? Yes. Okay. And have you disagreed with him in certain cases? Yes. 
Do you know how much time you spent with Michael Barrison in this case? Uh, yes, I spent 13.25 hours, 13 and a quarter hours. And I think I meant to ask you, and I'm not sure if I did, were you aware of Dr. Simring's diagnoses in this case? Yes. And that's why you said you disagree with him in this case? Correct. Now, you indicated that you met with Michael Barrison and that he looked different when you met him. Yes. Uh, what was his demeanor when you met with him? Well, when I first met with him, he was very, very tearful. I mean, he was crying uncontrollably. He almost at times was hard to console him. Um, he was very upset about the whole thing. And if I could just refer to my report, um, yeah, he was tearful, emotional, crying. He became animated at times, particularly when discussing uh, Lauren and... Um, uh, Robert Goodwin and the whole circumstances uh, with respect to that. Uh, he would stand up, get animated, and so on. He was very emotional um, about it, and um, yeah, he did that. Um, but he, he, you know, he after I ca he calmed down and he participated fine. He was cooperative, completely answered my questions, except for some resistance towards the end. Now, how would you describe his ability to recount uh, certain things that happened? Michael's memory from, as to what happened was excellent. He, I spent hours with him, I think over six hours, talking about what had happened. He gave me a day-by-day -day account of the activities that happened. Sometimes it was an hour-by-hour -hour account. Now, occasionally he would say, well, on July 24th, we, uh, you know, I woke up and I did this. Oh, oh, by the way, there's some something happened on July 23rd, and then he would go back to that. But that's normal. That's how that's how people remember things and recall things. But he remembered in great detail everything. I was very impressed by his um, memory. How would you describe his concentration during the times that you met with him? When I was with him, his concentration was basically okay. I was with him for hours and hours at a time. Now, he was emotional. He was crying and so on. But he, he, was, he was okay. His concentration was basically okay. What would you say was the most outstanding clinical feature that you observed? I was his crying and, and his being so upset about the, uh, about the whole thing. He's extremely emotional and, and, um, and animated. That was the most outstanding uh, feature. Uh, other than that, um, no, he was, he was pleasant. He was pleasant to deal with, pleasant to talk to. He was very appropriate and um, nothing bizarre or unusual in his demeanor other than what I just said or what he said. Now, you described uh, in general what a forensic evaluation or examination entails. Uh, how do you look at criminal behavior? Criminal behavior is best understood in, in three stages. The pre-crime context. Criminal behavior doesn't come out of nowhere. There's a, there's a context to understand it. Then there's the actual offense itself, and then there's the post-crime behavior. And that's really the best way to understand, uh, from my perspective, from a psychological perspective, criminal behavior. And how do you uh, learn that? Well, you learn that from the discovery. You don't learn that from what the defendant tells you, you learn that from the discovery. I should say one, uh, I should correct myself, a, a very nuanced thing that I just want to say a little bit different. Y yes, he told me what happened on a day by day, hour by hour, sometime basis, but I, I, I want to emphasize that's his perception of what happened. I'm not, I don't know if everything he told me is exactly correct, um, but that's what his perception was of it. But, yeah, it's, Yes. And I think you, you described earlier, Doctor, you started to talk about the way memory works. And can you explain a little bit more about that in light of your last answer? Well, memory is not, there's no video camera inside here that makes a videotape of what goes on. Memory is a constructive process. We construct our memory. If somebody asks you, what did you have for breakfast yesterday, you'll probably give them an answer, but it's constructed. It's not that you necessarily have an exact memory of it. It's, you know, you have very little time what you think, and then you'll uh, and then you construct memory. That's the way human memory uh, works. And you have, you know, you can have an event. I mean, you see this in, in legal practice all the time, not necessarily criminal, say an accident. Three people look at an accident, and three people give statements. Are those three statements going to be exact? No, they're not going to be exact. They're, that's how they perceive it. People perceive things differently based on many factors.
And if people perceive things differently, does that mean that one or more of them is having a delusion? Absolutely not. Doctor, you indicated that you, uh, as part of your examination, uh, gave the defendant some psychological tests. Yes. And I think you, you outlined those beginning on page 50 in your report. Okay, just give me a, give me a second, please. Yes. But before we get there, can I ask you, how do you choose what tests you're going to use in a forensic examination? Yeah. I give psychological testing to every, I won't say every single person, but I would say 99.99% .99 of the people I give a standard battery of psychological testing to. I give the Rorschach, the thematic apperception test, the Bender Gestalt, projective figure drawings, the MMPI-2, and a, a version of the Wexler scales. That's an intelligence test. If the case requires, I'll add additional tests. Um, tests for malingering mental disorders, for example. Tests for malingering memory, disorder, memory, for example. And other types of tests as well. But I give that standard battery to everybody. Why? I just want to get a measure. I want to get a baseline measure of, of the individual. And when I start my evaluation in a forensic case, I start with psychological testing. I don't start with, what did you do? Uh, what happened? No, I start with that because it's, a, it's sort of a breaks the ice, you know, and some simple tests and it's a rapport builder and this type of thing. So that's what I do. Now, in this case, did you give the defendant any tests related to intellectual uh, examination? Yes. What did you give him? I, I gave the Wexler Abbreviated Scale of Intelligence. The Wexler Abbreviated Scale of Intelligence is an abbreviated intelligence test that has a 0.93 correlation with the complete Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale revised. It means you're tapping essentially the same thing. Now, why did I give him the abbreviated test rather than the full Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale? But very simple. Intelligence is not an issue in the case, meaning intelligence is not an issue before the court. If intelligence was an issue before the court, for example, um, the issue is competency to stand trial based on limited intelligence, not necessarily intellectual disability, borderline intelligence, so on, then you're obliged to give the full test. If it was competency to waive your Miranda rights based on intelligence, if it's a social security disability evaluation, for example, and intelligence is an issue, then uh, yes. But, there, but in this particular case, Michael is an highly intelligent individual. He ran a very complicated business he had a, um, with lots of moving parts. Um, he had a location in New Jersey, he had a location in Florida. There was a lot of people that were employees. There were students and trainees there. There were animals there, horses. There was all kinds of consultants coming in, horseshoe people and veterinarians and whatnot. Um, he, he said these monthly expenses like $36,000 a month. That's a lot of money. That's a, a, a very big and complicated business. He's highly intelligent. Intelligence is not an issue in this case. Prior to seeing him, I also read Dr. Simring's report, who described him as highly intelligent. Uh, and I gave some weight to that as well. Um, so there's no need, in my judgment, to do anything beyond what I did. Now, after giving him that test, did that uh, corroborate what your impression was going in? Yes, let me uh, refer to my report on page 50. I found his um, full-scale IQ, it's his intelligence quotient, 119. That's the highest end of average, just one point below superior. His verbal comprehension index is 120. That's superior. And his perceptual reasoning index is uh, 112. This is all above-average intelligence. There's nothing wrong with Michael's intelligence, nothing. He's an intelligent individual. Did you give him any tests related to personality functioning? Uh, yes. Can you, and I know you had already said you give a standard battery of tests. What in general are the, the uh, to be personality functioning tests looking for or looking at? Well, you're, uh, generally you're looking at personality from different perspectives, from different ways. I gave him the Rorschach. I gave him the thematic apperception test, the MMPI-2, and projective figure drawings. And there's a combination here of projective tests and combination and, and, and the MMPI, which is a more objective, let's say, quantitative test um, as well. 
And I know you said you give some of these tests to establish a baseline, but what specifically do you hope to learn by giving these tests that would have value to your entire examination? Sure. Well, the Rorschach, for example, has been around since the 1920s. This is an excellent test if used properly. It's a very good test to determine reality contact, reality testing. For example, you show a card, and some of these cards look like bat and butterflies. I mean, that's, everybody kind of, I think knows that from the media and whatnot. So a, a, a person says to you, it looks like a bat, a butterfly, or some sort of winged creature. That's pretty good reality testing. What if a person says to you, it looks like an enemy? Well, that's not, that's not typical, and that gives you some insight into that. It's very good to determine if there's a thinking disorder, a formal thought mm -hmm. disorder. Does the person say, for example, it looks like a bat because here's the wings, here's the body, here's the antenna, here's the feet. That's very logical thinking. What if a person says to you, it looks like a bat because of that white dot right in the middle. What, that bats have white dots. That's showing a, a disorder of thought. They're drawing a giant conclusion based on a tiny bit of information. That's a red sign. What if a person says, it looks like a bat, response one. It looks like two alligators over here on the end, response two. That's fine. What if a person says, it looks like a bat with alligators attached to its wings? Now that's a thinking disorder. That's a problem with thinking. You're putting parts of reality together that should be kept separate. Um, and so some of those are some of the things you get from the Rorschach. Um, also, uh, the Rorschach is also very good to give you personality structure. How strong or weak is the underlying personality structure? For example, when you go to buy a house, you hire a structural engineer, not just to look at what the painting is outside, but to you know, go take those tiles you know, off with a flashlight to see what the structure is, to see how strong the house is. The Rorschach is a very good test to determine whether the structure is the level of a personality disorder, um, more severe structural disorganization, schizophrenia, or something like that. Um, so it's a, it's a very good test if used properly. Now, before I ask you about the Rorschach in this specific uh, case, I wanted to ask you uh, a little bit about the Rorschach itself. Are there more than one testing uh, or, or uh, scoring system? Yes, there's, there's, um, there's been a number of scoring systems used over the years. Rorschach himself, it's Rorschach because that's his name, Herman Rorschach. He had his own system. Another guy named Samuel Beck had a system. Uh, Bruno Klopfer had a system. Um, Zygmunt Piotrowski had a system. There's a whole bunch of these systems. I trained on the Beck system, but I switched to Klopfer because it's much better clinically. I think it's actually the best. What happened in the uh, mid-1970s to, um, to the 1980s, a guy named John Exner came around and created uh, his own system. He called it the comprehensive system. Why? He said, well, all these systems are good. I'm going to put it all together and I'm gonna make it in a very quantitative fashion, which sounded good, and everybody was interested in that. Now, I had training on the Exner system from John Exner. How? Because back in, I, I can't remember if it was 79, 80, or 81, when I was the VA, John Exner came there, he was promoting his system all around the country, and he's a good marketer, he really, really is good. And he gave a series of lectures, maybe, five, I don't think it was more than five, five two-hour lectures, to go over his system. Um, but I never liked it. Now, now why didn't I like it? Not because I'm so smart, because I'm not. But what he was doing is he was making the Rorschach, which is a projective test, something that it's not. It was never really intended to be that. But, okay, he wanted to do it in a quantitative way. The system really became very, very popular throughout the world, particularly in the 1980s and the 1990s, and, and, and schools were teaching this, and workshops were given all over the world, and computer printouts and books and all the rest of it. The problem began in the mid-1990s where um, it was determined that there was a lot of problems with the test in terms of its validity. Now, I should say this also. Exner put together what he called the Exner Research Council. The members of the Research Council are, were top, still are, they're all alive, uh, top-notch people who did research and promoted this and did workshops and so on. 
Greg Meyer is one, Joni Mahura is another one, Don Viglione is another one, Phil Erdberg is the fourth, there's one other person I can't remember. And, when, and, and these are top-notch people, and when they started hearing this, that there's problems with the system, they thought initially, maybe this is one off, uh, and, and then more, more problems came. And then um, by around 2000, it, it just became untenable. And uh, John Exner died, I think it was 2006, it was about 15 years ago. And I, I asked, I mean, one of the people on, on um, the Exner Research Council is a good friend of mine, Phil Erdberg. So I asked him, did you wait the Exner to die before you? For you completely, and they, they laughed. I never got an answer, but I think I know the answer. Anyway, um, they decided, they did research on their own, and they said, this can't go on. And they published um, a, a meta-analysis, a META. A meta-analysis is an analysis of analyses. And they published it in a prestigious journal called Psychological Bulletin. And a couple of other journals as well that really talked about the problems in the journal, that it's just, and, and the problems were two. There's problems with the normative data and the validity data. The normative data means how the test was normed by Exner. He didn't do, he didn't collect information and send it out for the peer review process. He didn't do that. He collected information and put it in his book and said, these are the norms. Well, that's a problem. And the validity uh, data as well. Um, now, I gave you a number of articles on that. Now, I didn't follow all of the details of the problems with the Exner system because I don't use it. I knew that there was a problem with it because I, Phil Erdberg's a friend of mine. We discussed it and, and, and so on. And, 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 and to be very direct, a lot of people that promoted this were quite embarrassed when this started happening because don't forget, they were spending years of their professional career teaching this, promoting it, and so on. And so what the Exner Research Council did after they published a series of articles concluding that it's not a, a valid uh, system of scoring and you shouldn't use it. Now, I, I want to make something clear. This is not my opinion. This is not an opinion. This is a conclusion reached by the Exner Research Council, those individuals closely connected with Exner and the, and the system. They decided to put together, uh, and they were committed to a quantitative approach to Rorschach, and they put together a new system. They tried to redo it. They thought first, maybe we could redo it, cut this. They said it was just not salvageable. And so they put together a new system called the Rorschach Performance Assessment System. And I think I gave you a manual. Um, and all the people listed there are all the people on the Exner Rorschach Council. Do um, you have another question? Yes, sir. All right. We're getting a little too narrative here. Yes. Well, I had asked them about the, the different scoring systems it, it, and about the extra system. Well, we heard a okay. lot about that yesterday. Well, no, I, I, I understand. Move on at this yeah, point. Just ask another question to follow up if you need to. Doctor, at some point, were you uh, made aware that another doctor named Dr. Charles uh, Hassan had examined the defendant in this case? Uh, yes. And were you provided with a copy of his report? Yes. Are you aware whether or not he uh, administered the Rorschach test to Michael Barrison? Uh, yes, he did. Uh, no, he did. Okay, wait, 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 just give me a second. I see you're, you're a little second. bit distracted. I'll yeah. wait until. No, um, no, he did not administer uh, the Rorschach to him. He used my Rorschach findings and said he rescored it using the Exner system, and he submitted it to the Exner. Um, computer program, which is still there. I should say, the, you can still get this, obviously. It's run now by Exner's daughter. Uh, she's not a psychologist, and she works with a psychologist in Euro France, Europe, and Fran I think it's France, and, um, and Japan. And so you can still get this. So yes, I, I'm aware of that. He didn't, he didn't administer it to him. He rescored it using the Exner system. Now, you said that you use the Clopper system. Correct. Um, what were your results after uh, scoring Michael Barrison's Rorschach with the Klopper test? Well, again, it's not just the, see, that's another problem. That's not just the scoring system. I, you know, I heard so much, you know, about scoring systems. The, the, you know, the Rorschach is not just wedded to a scoring system. It's how I explained it before. So my findings from the Rorschach, I found that there was inner anxiety, conflict, and tension, problems relaxing. Um, there were a number of what's called achromatic perceptions. There was a, a, attention to the, um, it looks like a, a, a bat because it's black. 
using the, 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 the black color, which is a marker for um, depression or depressive vulnerability. Um, so he has symptoms of depression, anxiety. He's not withdrawn from the outside world. Um, his inner life is dominated somewhat by impulsive tendencies and there's some form of acting out uh, likely there. His responses that he gave were well connected to the stimulus material. His reality testing was completely intact. There's no evidence of a thought, a formal thought disorder. His thinking was clear and logical. There's nothing suggestive of schizophrenia, psychosis, or even borderline traits. He gave two slightly regressive perceptions, and that's um, thing like throwing paint, fireworks, that type of thing. And it's very, very consistent with you find in individuals who have a personality disorder. And uh, those were the responses. In my report, I concluded exactly on page 52 what his responses were. They're logical, well-formed, well-connected to the stimulus material upon which they were based, meaning the reality testing uh, is good, and um, no structural disorganization. Um, I also found there's a capacity for empathy. He had an adequate number of human perceptions, which means he has an ability to establish good interpersonal relationships uh, with people. Um, Did you render any diagnoses based on the results of the Rorschach examination? No, you never render a diagnosis on the basis of any test. A, a test can give you just what I said, all of these different indices, and that could support or not support a diagnosis. But a diagnosis, again, is never based on psychological testing. Doctor, moving on to the MMPI, uh, what, what, if you could explain that test in a general sense. It's 310. I don't know if anyone else needs a break. I do. <laughs> if you get my meaning. So um, we're, we're just gonna, it's gonna be short because I know we're just sitting in the afternoon. So just 10 quick minutes. Relax for 10 minutes, use the facilities if you have to do that, and we'll come back at 20 after and pick up. All right, yeah, very good. You can just step down. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> 